Gospel according to St. Mark, the fifth chapter. We begin at verse 21. When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered around him and was by the sea. Then one of the leaders of the synagogue named Jairus came, and when he saw him, fell at his feet and begged him repeatedly, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. So Jesus went with Jairus, and a large crowd followed him and pressed in on him. Now there was a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for twelve years. She had endured much under many physicians and had spent all that she had, and she was no better, but grew worse. She had heard about Jesus, and she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. For she said, If I but touch his clothes, I will be made well. Immediately, her hemorrhage stopped, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. Immediately aware that power had gone forth from him, Jesus turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing in on you. How can you say, Who touched me? He looked all around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling, fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And Jesus said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. And while Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the leader's house to say, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the leader of the synagogue, Do not fear, only believe. Jesus allowed no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the house of the leader of the synagogue, he saw commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. When he had entered, he said to them, Why do you make a commotion and weep? This child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. And he put them all outside, and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him, and went into where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Tell him whom, which means, little girl, get up. And immediately the girl got up and began to walk about. She was about 12 years of age. At this they were overcome with amazement. Jesus strictly ordered them that no one should know this, and told them to give her something to eat. This is the Gospel of Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. A few months ago, I attended my second service at a historically African-American congregation. It was the homegoing service, the funeral, of John Candace's father. John is a gentleman we walk with on Fridays, co-founder of Connected, and who came and spoke to us inspiringly at the adult forum on a Sunday. In the first service that I had attended, crossing racial lines ingrained in my life since childhood, was to hear Dr. Beatrice A. King, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s daughter. I gave the benediction that day at the conclusion of the three-hour service. So when I blocked my calendar for this homegoing service, I knew I would need more than the 45 minutes our typical funeral might take. I was assured by the pastor the night before that there would be a time schedule controlled by the military burial to follow the service, so I could realistically block about two hours and believe I would be in good taste. I sat in the back. Yes, I'm still a Lutheran, even when I'm not up front. And I sat, and I heard the word read by those we walk alongside on Friday afternoons. And the psalm that we heard today became a chant. For God's anger is but for a moment. God's favor is for a lifetime. 
Weeping may linger for the night, but joy comes in the morning. And as the amens and the hallelujahs raised with authenticity out of the bellies of the gathered people, I watched this community claim the promise of the resurrection without apology in those moments, knowing that the journey was still going to continue. In that time, the resurrection was proclaimed without fear. Weeping may linger for the night, but joy, joy comes in the morning. Then this week we tuned in to hear the words of our president at another homegoing service. And as President Obama proclaimed Reverend Pinckney a good man, he dared to preach the word of God, and yes, he was preaching with sound theology. And he proclaimed the promise of God's amazing grace. He dared to stand before our country and proclaim not for God to bless America, but rather may God continue to shed his grace on the United States of America. It was beautiful. Psalm 30, you have turned my mourning into dancing. You have taken off my sackcloth and clothed me with joy, so that my soul may praise you and not be silent. O Lord my God, I will give thanks to you forever. As a country, as a people, as a people of faith, we are being shown what it can look like to lean into the promise of our baptism in powerful ways. Last night, as I spent an hour praying with Pastor Hennessy and several other pastors from around the region, somewhat painfully aware that my prayers don't carry quite the same cadence or room for participation, I was humbled, humbled by their joy. Their joy that came from believing so strongly in the irrefutable power of Jesus that they could see how God was using this tragedy and the pain of Charleston to change our world. Their laughter and their delight at the president's preaching from deep in his belly almost broke the speaker on my phone. I sat in silent awe in their living and breathing and proclaiming faith, propelled with promise, ringing with holy righteousness, delighting in the defeat of evil joy. Joy comes in the morning. And at the same time, members of our denomination wrestle with the guilt and the shame and the frustration and the fumbling that comes with trying to figure out how to bear the pain that one of our own youth confirmed in the ELCA allegedly killed two of our seminary graduates, Reverend Pinckney and Reverend Simmons. Conversation after conversation about how to hold this week's events in one hand and scripture in another alongside the request from Churchwide and our presiding bishop that we send, spend this Sunday across our denomination in repentance and mourning. And so we lean into the psalm, this gift that pours down to us through the ages and shows us that God's faithfulness endures forever. We have stood as a denomination and as a people, as verse 6 says, in the place of prosperity. We have walked within our privilege and our safety and stood as strong mountains. And we have felt the deep fear and shame of recognizing in these weeks our own part in the great evil that has occurred. And we have begun to feel the fire deep down inside of ourselves in the midst of our dismay. We have cried, what profit is there in our death if we go down to the pit? Will the dust praise you? 
Will it tell of your faithfulness? Hear, O Lord, and be gracious. O Lord, be our helper. And our psalm pulls us and promises us dancing instead of mourning, joy as clothing to replace sackcloth and ashes. We are called to praise God for opening our hearts, for opening our eyes, for giving us the audacity to learn from this violence and reclaim it from evil and propel us to a new day where black lives matter in our country. We have seen groundbreaking changes this week. The Supreme Court's rulings this week have set loose a plethora of rainbows across our country. Rainbows, the sign of God's promise to love us no matter what. The first covenant, the first promise of great love. And we have seen healing begin and there is still so much work to do. In our gospel today, we are shown the power of determined faith. Jairus and the woman who remains unnamed would have known Psalm 30 in their lives. They would have known the promise of morning's joy. They would have known the promise that God can change even the most despairing moment. For 12 years... Jairus raised his daughter, keeping her alive against many odds that pulled children away young. And now she was on the verge of death, and his faith called him, propelled him, to make his way to Jesus to beg for healing. For 12 years, this woman had done all that she could to be healed, to find her way back into community. She had gone from doctor to doctor, spending all that she had. She was desperate enough to break the rules and to go where she was told she was not allowed to be. Desperate enough to reach for God and believe in God's abundant mercy, even when she had been shown time and time again it was not for her. And in her boldness, she found healing. Joy comes in the morning. Not only because God wants it to be there, but because we choose to step forward with blazing audacity and ask for the impossible. To choose to believe so powerfully in the majesty of God that we demand a miracle and we expect it to occur in our lifetime. It is audacious to believe that we could ask God to use the events of these weeks to bring healing to our country and hope to God's children. It is foolish to proclaim that God's power could be big enough, could be strong enough to knock down mountains of oppression and racism and discrimination in our country, and yet that is exactly what our gospel tells us to do. To ask for our children to be brought back from the brink of death, for illness that racks our country for a fullness of time to be healed, for the bleeding to stop, for our mourning to become dancing, for our ashes to become joy, for our faith to be so bold and so demanding that our world becomes God's kingdom, a kingdom of amazing grace, grace that heals us all. Grace that sets us free to serve. Grace that gives us sight to a brighter and better way. Grace for all of God's children. Grace worth singing about.
So we pray for that grace. In 